This is Josh Spicer from GameWisdom.com. I hope you enjoyed this critical thought, your daily discussion on game design. Hi, and welcome to today's critical thought. Before we get going, thank you to, we're now at an astonishing 867 subscribers here on YouTube. Thank you so much for subscribing, and I hope you're enjoying the great content. If you haven't voted already, we are in a neck-and-neck -neck tie, or we're trying to break the tie for the 800 Let's Play vote. The, your choices are going to be between the Hitman 2016 play and a look at the classic games of PopCap. I decide that we're going to have a deadline of Sunday, October 30th. If no one has broken the tie by then, then I will just have to break it for us. For today's critical thought, we're going to be talking about esports, or specifically about the difference between competitive level play and understanding game design. Both, in a sense, rely on the same kind of skill set and the same kind of analytical ability, but they approach it from different avenues. Now, growing up, a lot of us, including myself, thought that the esports or professional game scene would be more akin to, of course, that classic movie, The Wizard, or specifically, indirect competitions. Stuff like who gets the highest score, who can be a game quicker, etc. But, as we looked into the 90s and beyond, we kind of saw the writing on the wall, and there's a few pretty big reasons why the esports market has definitely embraced competitive or direct competitions, such as Street Fighter V up there. The first one is, well, very simple. It's more exciting to watch. What would, do you think would be more interesting? Watching, piece, watching a competition of who can get through a matter level quicker, or watching the 100 best Street Fighter players in the world in a tournament to see who's the best. Direct competition just simply lends itself better to the viewing audience. It's a lot easier to process what's going on, who's winning, who's losing, stuff like that. And you can see this in any sporting or competitive game example. Street Fighter, Injustice, football, baseball, soccer, you name it. When you have indirect competition, it becomes a lot harder to properly show that off, and more importantly, try to explain that to an audience. Another thing that really, I think, affected this rise of direct competition is how the game, this game industry, other than competition-based games, have moved away from really presenting themselves as being, I guess, quote-unquote, esports worthy. For those of you who didn't grow up in the 80s and 90s, for the later half of the 80s into probably early to mid 90s, video games were still copying the arcade industry in terms of having a scoring system. Of course, scores literally didn't mean much other than to get an extra life, but there was no internet back then, we couldn't just upload our high scores. And it just was just an afterthought for the most part. The only places that really did use that were stuff like Twin Galaxies, who recorded video game um, high score records, which, as an interesting tangent, I think I hold two, I think two or three of them I currently hold. Well, hopefully I still hold, I haven't checked in a while. But, as video games have moved to become more cinematic or more engrossing, it really has downplayed a lot of them for being a competition-worthy game. For instance, how would we come up with a competition for Fallout, or Last of Us, or Shadows of the Colossus? Doesn't really work that well. Now, you could say we could make you know whoever beats the game first, but then that just puts an explicit limit on what you can do. There's only so f you can only move so fast in these games or play them so well, and whoever gets it the best. Well, the tournament's over forever. With direct competition games, you put things onto the players themselves. Now it's not about the AI, it's about two different people playing against each other, who, you know, their skills, their different mentalities, and letting that go. And when you're building it on the players rather than the rules of the game, it greatly extends longevity and just how much you can get out of it. 
It's one of the reasons why we're seeing a really big push on esports, especially over the last few years, to develop the people behind it, the players. If you watch the recent EVO of 2016, a lot of people were cheering for, um, I think, Long Island Joe, I think, L.I. Joe, I think that was his handle, and the story behind him. And this is what we see in any kind of sporting event competition, is that it's the players and their stories and, you know, what they do that really brings these sports to life. And case in point, you can look at any professional team, you know, football, soccer, baseball, whatever, and their are fans who love them. Now, the other part of esports is that it, another thing that really makes it work is the announcers. And this is another big challenge. I think it's one that we're probably not done talking about. One of the things about esports and competitions is that it's about watching as it is about playing. And some developers have been doing a lot to enhance that over the years. For instance, StarCraft II added in broadcaster options. You know, the ability to watch it from a broadcasting point of view and make commentary. We saw the same thing with like Command & Conquer. They even, I think Command & Conquer 3 or 4 had actual like play-by-plays you could draw on the screen like you would see like during an NFL game. And you need good uh, promoters, you need good announcers to even explain what's going on. Now with a fighting game one-on-one, -on -one, it's kind of easy to process. You can see who's winning, who's losing their health bars. But when you're watching something like Dota or StarCraft, or even what people have been talking about with Civilization turning that into an esports, you need someone who understands the game and can understand how to properly convey that to the audience. For me, uh, d during my brief period when I was into StarCraft II, and by into it I mean watching it, I was horrible at the game, I watch a lot of the commentary from Husky and Day9. I know Day9 is still doing things, so I'm not sure what Husky is up to these days. But you need someone who can properly relay this information and who can do it without, you know, scaring the audience or confusing them, you know, yelling, screaming, stuff like that. But with that said, there's still the challenge of higher or more complex games and trying to present that to an audience. I'll give you an example. A few weeks ago, I was watching on TNT, no wait, TBS, I think that was it, they were showing an Overwatch tournament. And I play Overwatch, I understand it okay, but it was just very hard to process what was going on when you're trying to follow these different teams and all the abilities, who's winning, stuff like that. And again, one of the things that game developers have been having to come up with is making their games esports friendly. That involves adding in these broadcaster features, adding in a special view for the audience so they can see what's going on and process it. Because you really can't watch things, watch only a player's cam, and know what's going on. Fighting games, again, are the exception. Now, with that said, we are approaching nine minutes into today's Critical Thought, and we haven't even talked about the differences in design philosophy. When it comes to understanding game mechanics, having an esports mentality or that competitive learning is very much akin to being a designer. Both sides are breaking down mechanics and systems, but it's done with a different focus. From a design point of view, or as a designer, you're looking at how systems are working. You're making sure your game plays well, the systems are integrated, stuff like that. From an eSports point of view, you're breaking down how mechanics operate against each other. Is something working against everything? You're looking at comparing different parts or different elements, and it's kind of hard to explain. I'm not an esports player. I've been trying to find someone to talk to on the Receptive Podcast about the very subject. But we can look at things with a very basic example. A designer working on a Street Fighter S game would be busy building the fireball animation, uh, balancing the speed, putting in the proper inputs, 
and stuff like that. For a competitor, they're going to be looking at, okay, this fireball, how does each other player respond to it? Can I zone with it? Does the speed match the damage, or vice versa? Is it something that can be used? Is it easily countered? Is it a move that no one would ever use for balancing reasons? These are topics that, while it's great for a designer to think about it, normally most developers are going to be too busy building the game to be thinking at this level of detail. It's, it's kind of a combination of low and high level thinking, if you think about it. You're looking at the numbers, the speed, the variables, etc., but you're also comparing it to everything else in the game. And that's a very important point of the esports mentality. When two players are fighting against each other, they're not just thinking about their moves. They're thinking about, okay, if my enemy does a jump uh, light punch, what's the correct move to counter that? Okay, they're now avoiding my throws. I need to adapt to that. But what if they adapt to that? And it gets into this whole idea of, you know, mind reading or trying to fake your opponent out and having such a master of the mechanics that you can adapt to any given situation. It's again where that difference between esports and regular play comes in. To put it another way, when we're thinking about an esports or a design point of view, it's the difference between someone who is just a professional mechanic versus someone who's a professional race car driver. Both groups understand how cars work but they both have a different understanding or a different focus on it. Most professional race car drivers aren't busy thinking about um, fixing an engine or making sure everything is working while they're busy trying to learn a track or race. Just as a mechanic is not really going to be thinking about the correct turns and again racing lingo which I'm not fully versed in compared to the race car driver. Both are very important mindsets, and it's how, you know, the whole racing industry has grown by having both these groups in there doing their own thing. Well, going back to game development, this is why for games that are built on the eSports or competitive focus, they get the professional players in there as early as possible to break these games wide open. When Street Fighter V was announced, you could bet that Capcom got in as many pro players as they could to play test that game early, and that's what they pretty much did. Because if they're the ones who are going to be looking at all these details while the developers are still building the game, building the systems, etc. It's akin to getting as many eyes on a game during early access, making sure that you have your audience looking at this game. Because as a developer, you're not going to have the time to examine how these mechanics are going to be balanced against everything else in the game. This is why for a lot of games, you're going to have patches to adjust things over time. Because again, you're never going to figure this stuff out, and it's going to be pretty much up to your fan base to look at things and break it down. But we're going to wrap up today's critical thought in the next minute. It's kind of, and there's one last point I want to talk about. As we've seen over the last two or three years, I would say, there's been a greater push at the growing acceptance of esports in the mainstream market, specifically among other sporting events. I remember like two years ago, I think ESPN gave like a scathing report about video games should not be considered a sport, or, you know, professional Hearthstone or Street Fighter. And I think times are starting to change. Now, as we all know, esports is a massive thing in South Korea, especially with StarCraft, Hearthstone, the World Cyber Games, etc. And I think we're all, especially those of us in the United States, are waiting for that to become more of a thing here. Um, I was talking to a friend, I think, on an earlier podcast about the day we see um, a pro video game player doing a commercial for Wii's or Frosted Flakes or stuff like that. That would be something that would make my day, I think that would make my life to see that happen over here.
But for you folks watching, I want to ask, do you think esports is at the point where it could be considered or it should be considered a sporting event as football, soccer, or whatever, and get all the perks and considerations for players that come with it? I personally think yes. Now, whether or not it's going to happen anytime soon, that remains to be seen. But with the growing rise of popularity of Dota 2 tournaments and showing competitive level games on TV, especially on ESPN, I think like 2 or 3, and on TBS, I think we are going to hit that point. And what that means, I think, is going to, we're going to be seeing, I think, more in terms of esports functionality or mechanics in professional games, or I should say competitive games. You know, Call of Duty, Overwatch, Hearthstone, you name it. And one last thing, I know I keep saying that, but I won't bring this up. There was talk about MLG creating their own esports title, something that they can control, and something that they would build specifically for them. I haven't heard anything else about it in the news, but for anyone following that, please let me know if there has been any updates on that front, because I'm generally curious to see what would be the first game exclusively made for the esports market. But again, we don't have the answers to that right now. So let's wrap it up. Once again, thank you to 867 subscribers here on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe if you're enjoying the content, as we are quickly, I think, making our way up to 900 subscribers, and then the big 1,000. Once again, I'm Josh Spicer from GameWisdom.com. Thanks for watching today's video. Be sure to check out more great content here and on GameWisdom.com. Have a great night. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoy it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel, and of course share with your friends, it always helps out. For daily posts on all manner of game design and industry topics, check out game-wisdom.com. To support the site and everything that I do, be sure to check out the Patreon campaign. If we can hit goals, it will mean more content for everyone to enjoy, and I'll be able to support myself and my household. If you want to follow me, you can find me on Twitter at GWBicer for updates throughout the day and random thoughts from me. And lastly, you can find me on Twitch right over there at GWBicer for daily streams most nights around 10 Eastern. Thanks again for watching the video, and be sure to check out more great content coming to the Game Wisdom channel real soon.